welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals podcast, a podcast about stage musicals that have been legally filmed and publicly distributed. The Filmed Live Musicals website contains information on nearly 200 musicals that have been captured live. Check it out at filmedlivemusicals.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals podcast. I'm your host, Louisa Lyons, and my guest today is performer and writer Alexandra Polting, whose new solo musical, 0874, A Filipino-American Love Story, recently played the She NYC Arts Summer Theatre Festival. The musical tells the story when Alex's college boyfriend moved across the country and her grandmother showed her a grocery bag filled with hundreds of love letters from Alex's grandfather. Welcome, Alex. Thank you so much, Louisa. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Very excited to chat with a fellow Filipino-American, although I'm not American, but I'm I'm also part Filipino, so <laughs> I'm very excited to to hear your story today. Yeah, yeah, the intersections of our stories are truly wild. When you messaged me, I was very excited to hear more from you as well. I'm, it's so exciting. So to start us off, what made you fall in love with musical theater? Oh my gosh. Well, it's definitely my Lala grandmother, the same the same grandmother that I speak about in the show. She showed me old videos of, you know, the like the recordings of Carousel and um, Oklahoma. I wanted to be Shirley Jones when I grew up. Um, <laughs> and then, I mean, Laius Longa, of course, um, all of the Disney intersections, the slipper in the rose, basically all of those all of those videos. Yes. Okay. Okay. You understand what I'm talking about. I, I have not <laughs> yet met someone else who I can talk about the beautiful Gemma with. So this is great. This is great. Oh, I like as you're talking. I'm like, yep, that's my childhood. My my grandmother, my abuela, showed me like had all of those musicals in her VHS collection, and that's yep. what I grew up watching in her living room. <laughs> yes. Yes. So is this um is this your grandmother from the Philippines as well? Are you? Yeah, that's right. One half of your family is Filipino. Is that right? Yeah, my mom's family. Okay. Yeah. And my dad's okay. family is Australian, Polish going, you know, Polish Dutch going back, but um mom's family is Filipino. And the 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 special musical in our house was South Pacific because my grandparents yeah. met on some enchanted evening. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition to those movie musicals, did you watch filmed stage musicals growing up? The one that I remember the most distinctly, and I think that you have this on your website as well, is the filmed version of Into the Woods. The millennial gateway drug. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, not for some. I made my friends who were, they had their hands in all types of sports and things. I made them sit through things like that at sleepovers, and they were very polite. <laughs> they were very polite, but uh, wasn't a gateway for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> They I were good friends. Found, <laughs> I hope you found friends that were also uh, found found love with Into the Woods. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, we're both in New York now, you and I. So we, we found our people. That's right. They found us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you've mentioned wanting to be Shirley Jones, an excellent life goal. Indeed. What led you to studying musical theater professionally? Well... I started performing professionally around the age of 10. Um, I think we, we had talked just before we started recording that we had both grown up, or rather we have both have family in the Maryland area. I grew up in Maryland. Um, I was really close to Washington, D.C. and also Baltimore. And so I grew up in in theater. So I did... I did children's theater and then I did professional theater. I was one of the children in um, Ford's Theater's annual Christmas Carol. And it was, it that was just, I was like, I know what I want to do. I got to call adults by their first name. It was, <laughs> it, it was just so incredible to be spoken to and collaborated with mm. at such an early age by just really really accomplished, interesting people. And it, and I mean, just the feeling of being on stage itself at the age of 10, I was like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. And mm -hmm. in a weird way, which maybe once we get to the show itself, once we get to 0874 itself, then this will come back. But it did kind of teach me 
to let go because I, I remember I did the show for two years and after two years, I just decided, I was like, I, this is, this feels done to me, which Mm. is very interesting looking back. I don't know if I ever quite walked away from something that I truly loved. Um, Do you mean this was the Christmas Carol? mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't really know where that came from, but, but I, from there, I started voice lessons and then I studied, I, I studied classical, I studied Western classical music in school. So in college, I studied vocal performance and I double majored with music history and literature. And then right after college I went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art which is where I guess I officially studied musical theater for the first time musical theater itself Mm. and yeah and now here we are like the crossovers in our stories because I also studied musical theater postgrad in London (laughs) yes yes that is insane so was that was that the first thing that brought you to London or were you there already I that that was what brought me to London I moved from Sydney to London to study musical theater and yeah. What, how did you find your experience at RADA? I loved it. I think that I, I just met so many incredible people from from all over the world. I think that was the first real global experience, global learning experience I'd ever had. And mm-hmm. now it's just it's amazing seeing what everyone seeing what everyone is doing. And um, I, I mean, I just loved the city of London. It was just so, yeah, so vibrant and so, so kind, a lot kinder than I was expecting. And so clean. So clean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Compared to New York, it is like the subways, yes. the, the, um, oh God, I'm blanking on the, the subway tube. system. It's not the tube, no, of course. <laughs> it sounds better when you say it with the little, <laughs> little tube. So I'm glad tube. you got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so clean by comparison to the oh subway. And but London is such a great city. It's so walkable. It's the theater is amazing, and I I love walking down streets that are like hundreds of years old right next to you know you have these cobblestone streets next to glass buildings like the contrast in history yes. is so fascinating yes um I remember seeing when I was at RADA I, I saw Showboat and that was another that was another kind of full circle childhood childhood um I don't know filmed musicals manifesting on stage it was yeah so so beautiful so fast forwarding a bit you say so you studied um in London and and you come back to the U.S. and then when did the uh inspiration strike for uh creating 0874 well let's see my as I speak about in the show, my college boyfriend, we met our senior year of college and we, let's see, he met me in London. He joined me in London and then we went backpacking in Europe before he started his PhD in California. Yeah. What is this? Is this another? I just, no, I just, I love that. <laughs> oh, I, I was so like, lovely. are you going to tell me that you also went backpacking in Europe in 2016? <laughs> I, a little earlier, but yes, I did. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah. So he, he moved to around the Los Angeles area. He went to the University of California, Irvine for his PhD. And I have a cousin Baz King, who I only, I met him because he was also in Los Angeles. And so when I would go out and visit my boyfriend, now husband, Tyler, Mm -hmm. then I reconnected with this cousin. Um, Mm -hmm. So he is also, he's in music. He's a musician. He grew up in South Africa and went to Berkeley. And that's how he got to the U.S., but because he grew up in South Africa, then we hadn't really met. And so it was just, um, it was magical being together. It was magical just meeting somebody else in the family who had their hand in music, in the arts, and whose brain thinks that way. Mm-hmm. And I think I had told him about these letters on one of my visits out to go see Tyler, maybe about two years into the five-year program. And he was like, that should, that sounds like a musical. That should be a musical. Granted, he he is not in the musical theater world. Um, he was like, that should be a musical. I was like, that's an interesting idea. 
for someone else because I had never <laughs> written anything. And I was like, that's nice. But then I think that it had just stewed for a few years. And I I think um, I, I had the opportunity to perform something at um, Olney Theater Center in Olney, Maryland over the pandemic. And so I tried my hand at writing a song. It was... Um, I performed The New American, which you you saw the show is about halfway through the show. And I had worked on it with my cousin and we tried our hand at one song. And then one thing led to another. And I was like, yeah, I guess a few years later, I was like, I guess, I guess you're right. I guess this this could be something. So then so then we started working. Oh, that is so cool. And so prior, like you had studied music and, and vocal performance, but had you studied composition or songwriting? I hadn't. No, no. I think that the easiest foray into that world was, like I'm sure many other teenage girls in the U.S., I did go through a poetry phase. So I was into <laughs> creative writing. I I thought I was the first person who ever discovered and truly understood E.E. E. Cummings. Um, <laughs> but it's it's really interesting because I think that um, the just I I think both the act of of going through a long distance relationship for five years and also the act of studying and then pursuing music professionally in a weird way I lost my faith in words and what they were able to and and how truthful they are on their own and so hmm. because for example with like with long distance I my evolving brain couldn't understand why would someone say they love me but also leave me but also choose something else or at least choose something else right now and and then with with music, I think that I was a little frustrated at the idea. I had listened to, I I guess I had this moment when I heard, I think it's Faré's Piano Quartet in C minor. I just had this moment of, wow, this is what, this is what music can do the first time I heard it live. And and there were no words involved. And in a way, that kind of changed my relationship with words and what they can do. And so long story short, I just, um, I, I wasn't really sure how much I believed in in something that I had dedicated, like, my life to as a student, but then also my time and energy to as a lover of writing. And it really wasn't until this show that I came back to just interrogating what um, what this relationship with with words is. Does any of that did any of that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Oh, that's really beautiful because it's like you had to take the words away to understand what the words were and how, yeah. how they could convey meaning and what they how they could how music can elevate those words. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So I have two questions about that. One is. Um, when you're writing with your cousin, with uh, Baz, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you when you were writing, because he was in California, were you writing via Zoom or like uh, virtually? How how did that process work? Sure. Well, we did our writing pretty much all in person, so we did mm -hmm. all of our writing together, and I think that was one of the blessings of. Um, of this project coming together during the pandemic, because for example, like I said, the first, the first song we ever performed was at Olney, which, uh, which sidebar is actually where I, uh, I was in South Pacific there. Um, just call back from our conversation about South Pacific earlier. Um, but that was through Olney through a virtual cabaret because there was no in-person theater. And then I had, received the opportunity, I guess about a year later, to work on the show at the Kennedy Center um, through their artist residency program. Mm -hmm. And this all was happening 2020, 2021, 2022. And with the 
pandemic being the way it was, and yet also with Tyler and I needing to see each other, then I did hunker down for part of that time in the Los Angeles area. And so we wrote together. We wrote, um, I think there's about 10 songs in the show. So I was, I was visiting for four weeks and we wrote, we wrote the bulk of everything in those four weeks. Wow. That is, that is a lot of content to put together in a month. It was a lot of content. (laughs) (laughs) That's really impressive. And what would you say were your inspir like your musical inspirations? Because the style of the show, like, it's hard to classify. Like it's sometimes it has Mm. like this classical undertone, but it feels folky and rocky and other points. And it, it showcases your gorgeous singing voice. Oh my goodness. Oh, thank you so much. The, the tones that come out, it's just like, like it, it truly gave me chills, like watching the show. It's so, so beautiful. So like, I've, I know you study classical music, but there, there just feels like there's so many inspirations in that musical style. Yeah, I I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. I think that part of the style, well, I I guess I guess building from the inside out. I knew that I've I've never tried to perform anything like this before, much less write it. But I knew I I know my voice and I know what needs to happen with it because um you you are also a singer I assume mm-hmm. okay fantastic yeah. so if uh, okay so if I, if I get a little nerdy then I I, I can so I knew oh, yes. that I needed <laughs> to um I knew that I needed to start in a way I, I knew that this was going to be a heavy lift vocally and so I knew that I kind of need to start it with a song that's almost like a warm-up so I started the first two songs in the show are are kind of my vocal warm up. So the the first song is What Do I Know? And it's first of all in within speaking range. So I know that my speaking range in general, I'm not sure how it is now, the week after the show, but in general, my speaking voice rests around a um an F or a G on the staff. And so that's where I put the sh- where I put the song. And mm. I also knew that as a classical singer, I mean uh one of the schools of thought from one of my voice teachers was having kind of a teacher vowel. So a vowel where you find, you, you find, you find basically the most clarity and the most efficient way of making the sound as you can, and then branch out into other, other vowels using the sensation of that vowel as a model. And for me, my teacher vowel was ooh. So that's why the song is what do I know and why the melismas happen on the uval. And then also the next song is, I believe, and that kind of branches up into my into my upper mix and also ventures above the staff and warms that part of my voice up, kind of not in really sustained or difficult ways, but just kind of in easy, easy ways that start in that speaking range and then kind of just branch upwards. And that song is, I believe... And the the E vowel is kind of the the focus of that song because I'm just kind of starting with those closed those closed vowels in speaking range, and then from there, once those two are set, then I can do the rest, um, and and the rest and the rest is okay, and then the rest and so getting that foundation right, then I can play with with the colors in the other songs, and there. I mean, I've only done the show a few times, but the hope is that it's not going to be the same every time. But once I get the foundation right, then I can play around, play with the way that a space feels and play with whatever the musicians want to give. The hope is that it's never the same. And the hope is that we never pretend to be anywhere or anything that we're not, both Mm -hmm. as musicians and people who just are living the human experience, which is different every single day, and also as as audience members and as people sharing an experience together. Yeah, what an interesting way to approach the writing, like that it's the performer brain is very much at the forefront, um, but it yeah. also in yeah. an interesting way serves the storytelling because you know you're literally you're physically warming up your voice, but you're warming up us warming us up as an audience too and like bringing us into the story oh um, good so it, it works like on on both levels I think that's like a really fascinating um way of approaching the writing 
Good. I'm, I'm glad that's how it feels. I'm glad that's mm. how it feels. I think that um, this is this is very. I don't know if this is exactly a problem, quote unquote, with my experience in musical theater, or if this is just something I've noticed. I am, I've noticed that, and, and as, I guess I'm talking mostly in like, you know, classic musical theater, what you think of when you think of Broadway and when you think of going to a show. I think that one of my little frustrations and one of the little mental acrobatics I need to do as an audience member is getting back into the story and getting back into the world of the show after intermission <laughs> because when I first like if I'm sitting down for a show I'm so excited and I'm ready to be immersed in the world but after intermission it takes me about like 10 minutes as an audience member to just kind of to buy in again even if I'm just thrown in and it can be the most beautiful set the most beautiful sounds the most incredible experience but for me as an audience member I still find myself needing to do the work. And maybe that's just my brain not shutting off, especially, you know, after looking at devices or waiting in a line for the restroom or whatever else it is. And so I guess part of me with this show, one of, one of the things I was interested in is, well, what if, what if instead of establishing a world that we're asking the audience to come into, we just bring, bring our world outward to them and so I wanted to I wanted to do that sonically as well I didn't want to mm. I, I didn't want to just like bombard people with with this sound and with these colors I wanted to just gradually move from speaking and from conversation into the music itself and the let the colors explode and ebb and flow as they may from there mm. You mentioned your band earlier. Uh, how did you come to work with uh, with those folks and how, how were they part of the process? Oh my gosh, they are amazing. I'm so happy that we get to talk about them. Um, thank you for asking. I think, well, first of all, Basti and I, um, Baz, Basti, Sebastian, we, <laughs> when we first started thinking about the show, we had, we had thought that the foundation was going to be more electronic and we, our, our initial idea was we're going to come up with basically an electronic base for the show. And then in the spirit of not wanting it to be anything other than what it is, whoever comes to the show instrumentally, we, we just provide this foundation and then they can build on it with their own creativity, their own background, their own instrumentation even. However, the Conley Theater is a gorgeous, historic, small opera house that is attached to a, a Catholic all-girls school. And it did not have, especially after only, what was it, four and a half hours of tech the day before the show, we did not have the ability to do, <laughs> to, um, to act on these things the way that we had or originally intended. And so, this is the space for the, the, art, the She NYC Arts Festival. Indeed, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we had to pivot, <laughs> mm -hmm. but in a way it was a blessing in disguise because we just, I, I think that we got to, especially because we're still in workshop form right now, just treat the thing as more live and treat the mm -hmm. instrumentalists as more artists and less as sounds just because we needed to be more immediate um, with everything. So Let's see. So Basti and I, we created, we, we still had basically just the foundation of all the songs. So I had melody and lyrics. He came up with um, guitar and we collaborated with on the overall shape of the songs and what we wanted the general feel to be. But then the rest was really just the genius of the other band members. So there's Isaiah Shim. Uh, he is our pianist extraordinaire. He and I actually met. He's another person from Baltimore. He and I met oh, maybe seven years ago, five or seven years ago, because we work at the same church. When I was when I was down in Maryland and when I was living and working there up until recently, which is 
actually the church where my mom works. And it's the church where I grew up going to receive my first communion, told somebody my sins for the first time <laughs> in this church. Um, and then Trevor, our drummer, was just just a godsend. We needed a, a drummer at the last minute. We had We had someone who unfortunately had to step out. And a week before the show, he came in because he he and his wife were actually putting up my director, who's also from DC. They're putting up, they were putting up our director, Aria Vells, in their guest room. And we lost our drummer. My director was like, I live with a drummer. And I said, uh, fantastic. I hope this will, I, I hope this works out. And it did. What are they doing next weekend? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> So yeah, it was it was really just such a beautiful coming together of you know the deepest root, which is family between me and Basti, and then building from this you know half a decade plus relationship with Isaiah, and then a week before the show, this edition of Trevor. So yeah, yeah, everyone did just such amazing work. Mm. Yeah. It's really interesting when you were mentioning about the idea of having electronic music as the basis, because something that I was thinking about as I was watching the show is uh, when your grandparents were writing their letters, that like that was the only way to communicate, really, because phone calls were horrendously expensive and um, uh, the the amount of time between communication was so long and it's, mm -hmm. it was just, it's like a different world. And then for our generation, like we have zoom and texting and, you know, like yeah. FaceTime, it's so much easier to connect with people long distance and it kind of makes that distance a bit smaller. So it's funny how technology, um, how you ended up going back to kind of um, analog instruments, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. out of necessity. That, that is really interesting. I it, it's, it's interesting, too, because when we're thinking, when Basti and I are thinking about future iterations of the show and the instrumentation and things like that, it's actually, it's we are still thinking about what the relationship with electronic music is going to be. Because, again, we don't want to mm -hmm. pretend that the show is anything other than it is. And it's a it's a creation of the 21st century. So... Uh, we want to speak to the moment as well without pandering to it. And so it's it's really interesting because right now we're thinking about the relationship between acoustic and electric possibly of being the world of the Philippines versus the world of the U.S. or, um, you know, the past versus the present. And we're also thinking about one of the one of the distinctions musically of the show is also how to be so many people, particularly <laughs> both my grandparents as one person. And one of just the beautiful things that the story itself just gave to us and put in our lap is my grandfather plays the guitar. So things from his perspective mm -hmm. are going to be led by guitar. My grandmother plays the piano. Anything from her perspective is going to be the piano. And that's, and that's what's going to lead the action there and then anything from my perspective is gonna be both because <laughs> that's just the way it is so so yeah just another one of the things that that we just we couldn't have planned and was just so beautifully just dropped into our laps yeah and then how all of those different instruments and musical styles because they would have grown up listening to different kinds of music than obviously than you did but how that also shaped what you listened to and then what what is the result of that which I think is the style of the show that it's mm -hmm. this beautiful eclectic mix of all different kinds of influences yeah yeah well law um I mean I know that you asked about genre at the very 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 beginning of this tangent I don't know I don't <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I am here is. for tangents. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> so to rewind a little bit, you uh -huh. mentioned the residency at the Kennedy Center, the page to stage residency. Can you talk us through that process a little bit? What how um what that residency provides and, and what was accomplished in that residency? Yes, one hundred percent. So Actually, the the way that the residency kind of came to be was just, I, I mean, it was just another one of those things that was just so beautiful that I couldn't have planned. Um, I met 
one of basically the person who hooked me up with this with this program and with this community, Trey McMichael, who is in Washington, D.C. He was the um, he was basically the DEI and safety coordinator for another show that I was working on, um, which was a production of Working, the musical Working, um, that was being produced and put on by the Labor Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. During, I think that was, that was fall 2020. So it was mm-hmm. the one of the first attempts, at least that I knew of in my area at putting theater back on stage in the middle of, yeah, in the middle of Everyone knows. In the middle of 2020. (laughs) (laughs) Indeed. So Trey and I, I I had done an Instagram takeover for the show and I had posted just, I I wanted to post what it was, the show is working and it's about working professionals. So I wanted to use the takeover to talk about all of the facets of being an actor or being a performer that somebody might not necessarily see. So started the day in my voiceover booth and like factored in my church job. So I like took the, took my phone with me to my church job when I sang, it was either a wedding or a funeral. And I, Mm -hmm. one of the things that I had done that day was, was go work out. I'm a, I, I'm a rock climber. So Trey saw the Instagram story was like I also rock climb so we went together and that's when that was when I started that's when we talked about the show and I had not really because it was just an idea at that point I hadn't really done anything other than Olney it was just an idea so I wouldn't I I wouldn't volunteer information about this show um, but we were just casually hanging out doing... literally on a, on a rock face <laughs> yeah yeah on a rock face it was plastic we were inside I, I make money with my face I don't I don't yeah. climb outside <laughs> I'm not that hardcore <laughs> um, but uh but yeah but we were we were just talking and then pretty much right after working he started this job as a curator at the Kennedy Center uh called me on his drive to work at 8 a.m. I was like, it's 2020. Why are you calling me at 8 a.m.? But he asked if I'd be interested in this residency. And we also partnered with um, with the Asian Pacifica Arts Collective in Baltimore, whose goal is to um, to champion champion the work and the stories and the perspectives of the AAPI community locally. And Let's see. So that was in fall 2020. The residency was in February 2021. So between that time, I went out to L.A., wrote with Basti, and yeah. Yeah. And what what does the does the residency provide funding or resources? What what do they help with? Yes. Yes. So basically they provide funding for for a week of a week of work. So they they give us a they give us a stipend that we are able to allocate however we want and mm. I was just really honored that it gave me the chance to employ my friends and also family with Basti um at a time that was just so just truly wild for for theater and especially regional theater and mm. new young theater. So they provided us with with financial resources, and they also provided space. So the reach at the Kennedy Center, which is the new, um, which is the new fixture there, I, I, I think it it was finished during the pandemic, or maybe right before, but it they provided us space at the reach, and so we had a week to work together in person. And then for this residency in particular, it culminated in a staged reading, which Mm. because of COVID, we couldn't have very many people there, but people also were able to attend virtually. And with the help of APAC, we were able to make the staged reading also a time to reach out to the AAPI and Filipino communities in the area. And and then also the Kennedy Center, I mean, amazingly, with um, 
with like um the the guys there were like Regis Voigt, Tony Yoon, just so so many amazing artists at the Kennedy Center. They who are in the multimedia team, they created a a documentary about about our week there. Oh, cool! Yeah, is and that they, available to watch? It is. Yes, I'll I'll send the link. I'll send. Oh, the great! Link. I'll put um, that in the show notes. That's so cool. Thank you. And because of that, because of the Kennedy Center and their reach, and the fact that this was going to live in multimedia, not just in a week of ephemeral art making, then mm. I was also able to use that opportunity to collaborate with Filipino artisans for who who dressed me for for the week and for for our time there oh cool oh how special that's really amazing so it just it keeps broadening the circles I hope so yeah yeah Yeah. and then what was the process for um the she NYC arts festival well let me see I think that I applied for the festival maybe late last year, forgot about it until about five (laughs) months ago. (laughs) And the process was that they've been, they've just been so, I don't really have much to compare the experience to, but they've just been so hands-on and just so, so, so supportive of all of us. I think that it was something like, I think out of 300-ish submissions, then about eight shows are accepted into this festival and we just started we all met each other for the first time I guess about four or five months ago and um they provided us with with the space and their and their network and their expertise and their help when applying for ways to finance this thing and uh and yeah, yeah. And I guess it's all uh it's it's still happening because even though the festival wrapped last week in person, then of course things are being released virtually now. Yeah. Yeah. And I I've, I've um I'm I have something on my calendar for this weekend that I'm streaming another musical and oh, I've also streamed um The Moss Maidens, which was a beautiful play, a very harrowing play about yeah. women who lure uh nazis into the woods to kill them um but it was really really well done and i'm curious how was filming like part of the contract from the beginning was that something they said we're going to be filming and streaming or is it something you could opt into like how was that part of the process yeah so it was always something that they were going to offer but I think that the real um, the real thing that was up in the air, the real component that was up in the air was um, was the negotiations with the union. So mm. I think that just because, you know, all over all of the entertainment unions, everyone is wondering, well, what is what what is the alchemy of of capturing a live thing? How does that translate into, you know, money and compensation yeah. for for the artists involved. So yeah, so the so the main the main point of contention was is always like what's like what is the negotiation going to be that best protects protects the artists and protects their their work and their rights mm-hmm. and things. So so yeah, so it w- it was always something that was on the table, but it was it just with everything else that's going on with with the rights of of artists and their work to live for however long in multiverse then that's just (laughs) that that has been that has been the big question yeah and I still it's I know it's still early after your show has been released online um but how do you feel about streaming your work and and filming live theater oh, I haven't streaming. watched it yet <laughs> <laughs> I mean I mean I I will I will I will <laughs> but I don't know if you're this way well I mean you're you're a podcast host so I'm sure you listen to your own voice all the time but unfortunately yes <laughs> <laughs> it's so difficult it's so difficult to listen to yourself um just yeah so I I haven't watched it yet but I, I in general I mean I I I suppose that I just w- whatever will what whatever is whatever form 
we can create something beautiful and useful as long as it's as long as it's fair to the people involved then of course of course i i i don't think that and i think this is what i really love about all of the team at least with 0874 and also with with our relationship with shenyc it's just it I, I think that after studying classical music, I am, I've kind of swung in the opposite direction of, I, I still love and adore um, Western classical music and opera and, and symphonies and concerts and they have such a, such a distinct and necessary place in the fabric of, of society and the way that that people interact with things that people make because that's what makes us people but mm -hmm. I think that with this group right now and especially with this work I again I just I never want to pretend that anything is other than what it is and what it is now is that filmed filmed productions and filmed theater is how how we reach people i don't i don't want to I, I don't want to focus more on on how to how to stay relevant than focusing on is this is this helping people and speaking to them and being true like i mm. never i i never want the former to overshadow the latter for me personally yeah and if film think... shows are how we do that then great let's let's figure it out yeah, I think that's a really beautiful way of looking at it. And I really like the idea of filmed theater as being part of the ecosystem. And I know there's mm -hmm. like, this fear has largely dissipated now that this like film theater will replace the live in-person experience. But I mean, it's still, it's still like an undercurrent of like why we can't stream yeah. everything and I'm glad from your perspective that it's dissipated though <laughs> I mean that's great I mean you to would a degree. know, you would know. <laughs> <laughs> to a degree but I I really like I I'm a big believer in this idea of making it accessible and I, like I said part of the ecosystem like it's part of the fabric mm -hmm. like like you said of 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 the human experience and of performing arts that this is it's it's another way that we can reach people and whether we're reaching them through their screen or like if they have the privilege of coming into the theater um they they can coexist together mm -hmm. um so with that in mind what is next for 0874 a filipino american love story What's next is that the founder sleeps. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first, this is the, us speaking is the first thing that I have done <laughs> since the show. Um, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's brutally honest. I love it. <laughs> and um, I don't know. I mean, I think that we're still, this is, this is the first time that the show itself, this is the first time that we've, um, We've produced the show, I mean, outside of outside of a structure like the Kennedy Center. And so there are still odds and ends to tie up on the back end of things. So that's next. Um, but then really just I, I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure because, I mean, I like other than this show, I my career has been as an actor and as a performer and I think that I, 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 I built a very careful house when it comes to that, that world of my artistic life. I stayed in D.C. until I, I graduated and came home from RADA. My first full year of work was like 2017. And in a few years, like I built this careful house where I, with the help of my parents who let me live at home with them, I was able to live with them until I built a financial safety net. And like I stayed in DC until I got my equity card. I stay. I didn't move to New York until I I found an agent and I built this house and made and, and I got a, I I got an off Broadway offer for a show. And of course, like all of that built up in March 2020. <sighs> and so I think that contrasting with the fact that this show started 
on mats at a rock climbing gym. <laughs> I think just like, and my, the most important collaborator to me is my blood relative who I wouldn't have met if my person didn't move away. Mm. Um, I think that these, um, like the, the carefully curated and planned side of my career, like contrasted with the completely serendipitous grace filled side. I, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think that the tension is going to exist between those two and I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but I know I'll find it more easily if I sleep first. <laughs> so I'm going to do that. <laughs> yeah. Self-care. And I, the, the line that came to mind as you were talking was, um, life is what happens when you're making other plans. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. But I, I think I, I see a future for this show. I, I, I hope it it has a long life and I can imagine it being licensed one day. Like it's just, it's so beautiful and I'm, I'm so excited to see what's next. So I, I will be following intently. Uh, but this so brings much. us to my final segment, my favorite things where I ask you my favorite questions. These are a few of my favorite things. First up, what is your favorite musical? Ah, ow, <laughs> ouch. Um... <laughs> I I think that the one I I can't I can't mm. okay R- my answer right now my answer right now and especially my answer as a you know having the having the writer hat on as well as being a performer my answer right now is Natasha Pierre in the Great Comet of eighteen twelve oh that's a fun one yeah I love that. Do you have a favorite filmed live musical? So a musical that's been filmed live on stage. I don't know if I have a favorite filmed live musical, but the one that I think about, the the two that I think about still over and over are The Lion and Come From Away. Oh, The Lion. Yes. Oh, I love that show. And there's, I have an episode with the composer, Benjamin Scheuer. I listened to it. It's very good. Thank you. (laughs) Yes. Oh, such a beautiful show. How very appropriate for a (laughs) singer-songwriter. A film life musical isn't quite a stage show and it's not quite a movie. So what should we call it? Mm. Um... Whatever, whatever the public decides to call it, <laughs> the, 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 whatever, whatever name persists is the one that it that it shall be called. I guess. Um, oh, Very I, diplomatic. I, I also, I also want to, um, I, I also want to put in. I don't know if this counts because it was a true pandemic creation, but I absolutely mm-hmm. adore um, Animal Wisdom by um, oh, by Heather Christian, directed by Amber McGinnis, uh, that was mm-hmm. done at Woolly Mammoth. Um, Ooh, oh, they so, do such good stuff. So, so beautiful. So, yeah, I'm not quite sure if it counts because I'm not sure if it counts as, like, filmed live musical, whatever we decide to call it. <laughs> but if it does, then adding that to the list for sure. Oh, I like that. I, I have to check it out. It's not one I don't know. I did stream from them over the pandemic. Um, I'm trying to remember. It was the actor from Glee... And the show was called, it was about dating as a person with a disability. It'll come to me. But that okay. was, it was, I was like, please stream everything. Your captures are so good. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> where do you stand on bootlegs? I, I think that it's the absolute worst to be an actor on the other side of them how I mean and it's also I mean just from the perspective of like intellectual property and compensation and things like that of course that's not you know of of course that's not equitable in any way however it, it does it they, they make me more curious than anything of like oh this persists and this deviation persists because there's because there's a need and so like what is this what is this deviation trying to tell us like as a as an industry does that Mm -hmm. make sense yep absolutely yeah so I guess like I'm trying to be more curious than judgmental 
However, when as an as an actor in the, in the moment, then it it really is. It, it really just feels so so vulnerable and such and mm -hmm. such an infringement and feels so um feels like the the amount of the amount of trust lost is just so it's really hard to get over in the moment yeah 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 that's what i've um that's a really unique way of putting it i i like the performer's perspective the mm -hmm. vulnerability i think that's really important um what stage musicals do you wish had been filmed hmm <sighs> I am so sad that I never saw In the Green by Grace McLean. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> oh, the feelings I have about that show. Yes. Yes, yes. Oh, so um, good. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love to see that at some point. Um, other things that I wish had been filmed. I think it would have been really interesting to see a filmed version of the SpongeBob musical. I think that would you be can. Very interesting. Oh, oh, they filmed oh, oh, it. Okay. Yes, they filmed it in oh, wow. um, in the UK. So it's it's on Nickelodeon and Paramount from memory, but it's it's in the oh, database, okay. so you can find it. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Is you're this, welcome. Uh, this, Ask this and is you how, shall receive. I was gonna say this this part of the show is in there so that you can just help people in real time. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> Or commiserate over shows like In the Green that should have yes. been filmed. Oh, truly, Grace McLean, what a queen. Mm -hmm. um, what would you like to see filmed in the future? Hmm. Hmm. I really loved, this isn't musical theater or theater in any way, but I really loved um, Senior, the documentary. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. and his uh, and his father. It was oh, just, I don't know this. It it was a really gorgeous documentary about um, about Robert Downey Jr. or sorry Robert Downey Sr.'s work in um, mm. in the film and in that industry and just it was this beautiful um, tribute but also family story and meditation on the end of life and like family and work. And mm. I think that I would just love to see similar behind the curtain looks at, um, at the lives of our theater legends and, mm. um, and the, and the lives of a theater work that, we love and how it came to be that. So I, I don't know. I, I guess it's not, that's not an answer. I, I guess, I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for. <laughs> no, I think that's really, absolutely. And it's part of something that like, of, if on my wish list for film live musicals mm -hmm. is that, you know, we go back to the days of um, features on DVDs where they have those behind the scenes, oh like gosh. tours. And like, I would love to have like, a box set where a you can see different casts because that's really important to me mm -hmm. that it's it, there is no one definitive cast mm. but also imagine if you could have like stage manager cam and conductor cam and like being able I to see like that. the behind the scenes element um of how a show comes together because it's more than just like what we see on the stage is just the tip of the iceberg of like this behemoth that is putting on a musical yeah. and it would be so awesome to be able to have access to what that world is and how it's created and who are the people and what does it take to put on a musical? Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the Metropolitan Opera DVDs are really good with that as well with like Ooh. Renee Fleming. Um, I, I just remember, I, I think it's, I think it's Renee Fleming with, with Carmen who just takes us behind the scenes of Carmen. Yeah. But they, they did a really great job of that, but Oh, the feeling of a DVD and like the title screen and, <laughs> and like just wanting, cause after you see something, you, you don't want the experience to be over. So you want to go yes. to the next, the next thing. And so the idea that like we could go back to curating that for people, I love that idea. Yeah. I think yeah. that's something we really miss in digital mm -hmm. is that we don't get often, we don't get those kind of extra behind the scenes, deep dives, you have to kind of go looking for them, but it's not part of the stream more mm -hmm. often than not. Um, but like you say, the Met Opera does such a great job of doing those like behind the scenes interviews and yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, they are the masters and, you know, some of the earliest adopters of digital. Um, yes. the final question, where can we find you online? Well, I am on Instagram as alpal1210. Right now, uh, my posts are mostly about the show, but then also um, Basti and I did release one of the songs from the show, I Will Wait, as a single. So that's uh, that's what the content is until... Uh, <laughs> until until, until I rem- slept <laughs> until I emerged from hibernation yes 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 um so yeah I'm on as alpal 1210 I'm also on um my website is alexandramariapalting.com and that has information about the show but then also me as a human being um and also find me offline too that's that's the preferred <laughs> that's the preferred thing yeah love that Alex, thank you so much for your time today. It has been truly a joy to chat with you. I really appreciate you asking. Thank you so much, Louisa. And also thank you for just just watching the show so generously. You never know how these sorts of things are going to be received virtually. So I just, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. The Film Live Musicals podcast is created and edited by your host, Louisa Lyons. FilmLiveMusicals.com features information on nearly 200 film stage musicals from around the world and dating back to 1938, a weekly newsletter with upcoming streams, and this very podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and make sure to sign up for the weekly newsletter to have upcoming streams delivered straight to your inbox. Film Live Musicals is financially supported by Josh Brandon, Geraldine Brewer, Belinda Broido, Andy Capone, Elliot Charles, Rachel Esteban, Mercedes Esteban Lyons, Hannah Graneman, James T. Lane, Jim McCarthy, Alison Matthews, Al Monaco, David Negrin, Jesse Rubinowitz and Brenda Goodman, David and Catherine Rubinowitz, Joe Tillotson, and Beck Twist. If you would also like to support the preservation of the history of film stage musicals and the creation of one easy place to find them all, you can now make a tax-deductible donation to Film Live Musicals via the field. Visit filmslivemusicals.com to learn more. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and thanks for listening.